Welcome everyone to Spine Conference. Today's discussion will be metastatic squamous lung carcinoma to the spine. Unfortunately, this conference was uh, originally taped um, two days ago, uh, and it was um, done uh, in the usual fashion with approximately 10 to 15 people or so, uh, uh, pathology, orthopedic surgery, and uh, multi-specialties, and unfortunately, the um, discussion was lost uh, due to a computer error, error so it's done again, uh, but unfortunately, it's all by myself. The case is a 78-year-old woman uh, who presented to my to the office with uh, the chief complaint of, in her own words, my legs don't work. Um, she has a known history of a T12 uh, metastatic lesion on a CAT scan and PET scan. Uh, the visit was on 6 10 15 and she described uh, ataxia, difficulty walking, numbness in the legs. She felt her legs were detached from her body, fall, stumbling for two weeks. Uh, due to these symptoms, uh, the uh, oncologist, she called the oncologist and the oncologist referred her and I saw her immediately. She did have a, a history of low back pain for two months and she had been to the urgent care um, center where uh, she was evaluated, had x-rays which were normal. She was then referred for a CAT scan on 42415 which showed a T12 lesion. Uh, she then had a bone scan uh, the next week which showed a T12, uh, isolated T12 lytic lesion and then a CT guided biopsy on 51215, which confirmed the diagnosis of metastatic uh, lung carcinoma with the T12. Uh, I then saw in the office 61015. Uh, on the same day, she had a PET scan, uh, which we will review. Um, she is significant for uh, a right upper lobe lobectomy, August 2012, for squamous cell carcinoma, COPD, uh, transient ischemic attack in the past, bilateral total neoarthroplasty, and right rotator cuff repair. This is a CAT scan from 2012, three years ago, which shows the uh, on the right upper lobe um, the speculated lesion, uh, which was found to be a carcinoma, um, and which was removed. After removing the tumor, uh, the patient did very well. Uh, this is the CAT scan 42415, uh, which shows here an, uh, an isolated, basically a loss of the T12 posterior spinous process. And you can see here on the right, the T12 uh, posterior spinous process is gone. Um, this uh, lytic uh, uh, abnormality is um, very consistent with um, a carcinoma. On the axial cuts, uh, you see here there's no posterior elements to T12. A bone scan um, uh, shows um, a very nondescript, um, subtle abnormality of T12 where T12 just slightly lights up. This is the posterior view and the anterior view, you can't see it at all. And the posterior view, you can see it a little bit. When you zoom in to these uh, areas, um, again, uh, in the delayed images, it lights up at T12, but uh, very mildly. You would, you would think it would light up uh, better. Uh, here's the biopsy, and you can see the needle is headed right for this soft tissue lesion of T12. Um, just a reminder that these uh, CT guided biopsies uh, have very low morbidity, so uh, it's good for the patient. Sometimes you can't get enough um, tissue, but now with the uh, new advanced staining techniques, uh, usually the tissue uh, sample is adequate. Uh, usually the, the lytic lesions are a lot better than the sclerotic lesions. Accuracy is 93% versus 76%. Here's the PET scan on the patient. On the bottom level, you can see where the cut is. Here the cut is in the proximal femur, and here's her, here are her legs. This is the thigh, this is the thigh, and the middle is the femur. Um, this is another level of the femur. These, are, these, these, these levels are negative. Uh, this one is at the level of L4, and this one is at the level L5. Just gives you an idea of what the normal PET scan looks like. This is where uh, T12 lights up right here. Um, um, the other areas are, are normal signal. Um, I assume they're liver, kidney. And then um, um, the radiologist here uh, circled the uh, intense uptake of T12, um, which is uh, consistent with increased metabolic activity of T12 of a metastatic lesion. These are more um, PET scan images. This is the um, PET scan, and it's rotating, 
you can see here here's T12 uh, the the posterior um, portion of T12 which lights up these two beans on either side of the kidney and you can see here the uh, radiologist is rotating the PET scan image uh, showing this isolated um, increased uh, metabolic uptake uh, at T12 which is consistent with the tumor. These are the x-rays, uh, AP and lateral in the AP view, uh, basically no scoliosis, um, no significant abnormalities. Uh, T12 uh, is visualized here, uh, nothing really that abnormal. If you look very carefully though, you can see here uh, there's a dark area which is loss of the calcium. Uh, here on the lateral x-ray, uh, really not much to see. I also ordered thoracic x-rays just to make sure there's no instability or fracture, uh, abnormal motion, and you can see here at T12 is relatively normal appearing. So uh, after I saw her the next day, she went for an MRI scan of the lumbar spine. This is two sagittal cuts, and you can see here the spinal cord. And you can see the spinal cord is being compressed by this abnormality here in the posterior spinous process. And interestingly, you can see the posterior spinous process here on the MRI scan, and it's very abnormal, uh, but all the calcium is gone. That's why the CAT scan is negative. And you can see here another view, uh, that uh, complete... Uh, um, uh, infiltration of the posterior elements of T12 by this lytic lesion. Again, the spinal cord is being compressed by this lytic lesion on the sagittal cuts. Another view of the uh, complete obliteration of the T12 posterior spinous process. These are the axial cuts, same, same level. This is at L1. You can see the L1 pedicles are very small. That's important in the uh, reconstruction, the surgical reconstruction, because I felt preoperatively low probability that I would be able to uh, insert a good screw at L1. Uh, L1 usually is the smallest pedicle. And you can see here on the right, the tumor does infiltrate the L1 pedicle. This is at T12, and you can see the entire posterior elements um, are deformed, are basically uh, infiltrated with this uh, expanding lesion. This is uh, above at T12. So just a couple um, of facts about uh, lung cancer. The odds for a man uh, are 1 in 13 in their lifetime, for a woman 1 in 16. Uh, and new cases every year in the United States, uh, 226,000 about the population of Scottsdale, Arizona. And deaths every year in the United States, 160,000 about the population of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. This is 2012 data. So it's a lot of people. Risk factors are occupational, people in mines, heavy uh, metal workers, cigarette smokers, secondhand smoke, a family history of lung carcinoma, radon gas, which is important to check our homes, uh, aging, other illnesses, pollution, exposure to radiation. Of all the lung carcinoma, most, 70-80% are non-small cell type. Uh, of the non-small cell type, about 30 to 50 are squamous cell. So squamous cell carcinoma is a common cancer. Just some more basic facts. Squamous cell carcinoma arises centrally within the main lobar segmental or subsegmental bronchi. It extends into the lumen of the airway with invasion into the underlying wall. Uh, because they exfoliate malignant cells from the bronchial surface, squamous cell carcinoma can be detected by cytologic examination at its early stage of the sputum. It's usually slow growing. Um, for our state, the state of Maryland in the United States, um, breast cancer is, uh, has the highest uh, uh, incidence. Number two is lung. Um, when you have a metastatic tumor to the spine, uh, they're mostly uh, extradural, 90%, only 10% are intradural. The other issue that's uh, very important is that in 15% of cases, you have non-contiguous metastases. So, I have a very low threshold, threshold to get an MRI scan of the entire neural access uh, uh, to make sure there are no metastatic processes everywhere, anywhere. These patients uh, with metastatic spine tumors usually present with pain. Um, estimated new, can new cancer cases in the United States uh, in 2012 were uh, 1,638,910, um, um, which is about 1 in 92 people. The state of Maryland has a slightly lower incidence. Uh, we have 5 million um, uh, in our population of 31,000 uh, in 2012, so 1 in 161. This is um, a review of metastatic carcinoma to bone. This is a, about a total of 3,000 cases 
Out of those 3,000 cases, 362 went to the spine, so about 10%. Other very uh, high incidence areas are the proximal femur, 439 out of 3,000. Uh, the, the pelvis, 342 out of 3,000. Uh, and the ribs, 252. Cancer can metastasize, uh, metastasize commonly to the lungs, the liver, and to bone. And the process of metastasis is very complicated. First, you have the malignant neoplasm. Blood vessels have to invade this neoplasm. The blood vessels has to have to grow. The tumor itself has to invade into the arterioles of the venous system. They have to embolize and live. They have to lodge into the bone in a slow area of venous a flow, which is proximal femur is very common. They have, they have, the tumor cells have to adhere at that point to the vessel wall. They have to extravasate, and then they have to live into the, into the bone. The venous system is a very common area for metastasis, and the, this is Batson's plexus. Batson's plexus is a very rich venous um, network that's along the spine. So on, on the right side here, you can see uh, an axial cut of the spine, and portions of the spine are very, have very rich uh, venous um, uh, vessels. And you, you can see this during the surgery when you remove a vertebral body with a rongeur or something like that. Sometimes you get these very large bleeder, venous bleeders, and usually it's just a simple thing. You pack it off with wax. Um, but it's just something that you have to keep in mind, and it's in these very rich venous um, areas where tumor can become lodged. Now, Dr. Batson, Oscar Vivian Batson, was a pathologist at the University of Pennsylvania, professor of anatomy, and he wanted to understand how does prostate cancer get to the spine. And what he did is uh, he inserted a venous catheter, this is a cross-section of the penis, into the penis of a chimpanzee, and then pushed um, uh, um, venous uh, contrast, and then looked where the contrast went. And he found that when he Made, when he had the chimpanzee, when he pushed on the chimpanzee's abdomen and gave him a, a Valsalva maneuver, uh, there was the ri very rich plexus um, of, um, of veins along the spine. So you can imagine if someone coughed or performed a Valsalva maneuver, uh, the tumor, instead of going into the IVC, into the, um, say, lungs or the liver, could go into Batson's plexus and then uh, be lodged into the spine. This is just uh, Valsalva himself. The most common metastases of the bones are breast, prostate, lung, renal, hematopoietic, and thyroid. About 70% of all metastatic disease eventually involves bones. So it's common to have a tumor into the spine compressing the spinal cord. And when you have these cases, the question is, do these cases uh, need surgery or can they be treated with radiation and chemo alone? And the best study to date uh, by far is a Patchell study in the Lancet of 2005, um, which revealed that spinal cord compression from metastatic disease um, was randomized um, to radiation alone versus surgery and then radiation. And they followed these people and they found uh, that uh, the people who had surgery walked 84% uh, of the time at the end point versus 57%. And most more um, um, dramatic was uh, the people who had surgery walked for uh, a median of 122 days versus only 13 days for the people who had chemotherapy alone. So uh, the other thing is when people uh, presented uh, inability to, with an inability to ambulate, the people who had surgery resumed walking 62% of the time versus only 19% uh, of the time with radiation alone. So what commonly happens is these patients uh, uh, present to the office and uh, they have this uh, very catastrophic uh, diagnosis of cancer and also cancer compressing the spinal cord. But these people want to walk. I mean, patients want to walk. Uh, um, so most of the time, um, it's better to have surgery than not to have surgery so that you can walk. Um, now, the thoracolumbar junction is a point of severe stress. The ribs are, are a um, stabilizer to the thoracic spine, and the lumbar spine is very mobile. So the thoracolumbar junction is, a patient, uh, is an area of great stress. 
So the question is, um, what surgery to do for this patient? So this patient's a 78, but very vibrant person. She am she's ambulatory now. She can't walk. She lives alone. Uh, she has this metastatic, isolated metastatic tumor. So I think it's very clear that um, the patient has symptoms. The best treatment option is surgery. So um, what surgery to do? Um, first, uh, the tumor has to be resected uh, as much as possible. And obviously, margins cannot be obtained because it's up against the dura. Uh, and then after resection, due to the fact that it's at the thoracolumbar junction, I think there's a high probability that uh, she would fracture or become unstable if it wasn't stabilized. So uh, I wanted to have at least four points above or below uh, the, the um, area of resection. Um, and um, things went well, except uh, I did have a pedicle fracture at L2, and then I, had, I just put the screw in at L3. This is after decompressing the spinal cord. The head's on the left. This is um, intraoperatively. Um, the sac is the white matter. The dura is fully uh, decompressed here. You see, there's just a little bit of is now feeling uh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the uh, areas. Um, and this the is the is into the frame and making sure there's no residual tumor. That's the L1 pedicle? The uh, tumor was adherent to the um, T12 pedicle. Um, Decal sac and um, uh, the dura was very thick in this, this tumor as well. So uh, 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 maybe one layer uh, of the dura had to be removed um, during this process. But the dura was very thick, so th uh, there was no chance of a spinal fluid. Well, a small chance, but uh, there was no spinal fluid leak. So postoperatively, the patient um, um, did extraordinarily well. She stood the first day, and she wanted to go home post-op day one. So I sent her home. Um, once she got home, she didn't do so well. She developed a very bad ileus from the surgery itself, and she went back to the ER post-op day three. She did have a cascade due to this ileus, um, and um, the, just, this just shows the screws, uh, screw placement in T12. Um, um, I thought that was T11 actually, this is T12, you see the, the pedicle screws are in a very good position. Interestingly, I was able to cannulate L1 with 5 millimeter screws, so that was good for her, decrease the amount of surgery, and you can see it has to, it really has to be a bullseye to get into the pedicle. Here's a medial wall of the pedicle, here's a lateral wall of the pedicle, so it really has to be a bullseye to get it in. Uh, it was doable because um, I, I could palpate the L1 pedicle, so it was done under direct vision. Here's the screw uh, on the left at L2, and uh, the screw on L3 was inserted, but it broke the pedicle, so um, I wanted to be sure that I had good fixation, so I went down another level and, and put a screw on the other side. So the pathology. Unfortunately, Dr. Seeger was present during the conference, but I lost uh, her very nice description. And she had... Uh, um, um, biopsies uh, from the original surgery, from the T12 biopsy, and also from the, the other surgery. Uh, and this just shows the atypical um, uh, cells um, that were present. And um, the uh, you can see atypia in, uh, um, of the cells. This is the CK5-6 uh, marker, which was strongly positive, and this is a positive for a squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, also, P, uh, P63 was uh, strongly positive uh, for squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, the other tests were negative, so um, uh, um, which uh, ruled out adenocarcinoma. Uh, and this is um, this shows this is the surgical excision, and you can see the palisading um, uh, pycnotic cells, uh, uh, which show the dedifferentiated um, uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Again, here uh, areas of uh, hyperpycnosis and uh, very dedifferentiated cells. You can see here some um, uh, squamous um, keratin. Uh, giant cells invading the tumor, trying to control it. Uh, more giant cells uh, trying to invade it. Uh, this is a vessel, a venous vessel, so you could imagine uh, this uh, very richly um, uh, vascular uh, tumor which was resected. This is, uh, shows all sorts of different things uh, present on the same slide. Uh, normal cells, uh, cancer cells, uh, dedifferentiated cells, and uh, a very rare spicule of bone. 
um, that was present. This was a very soft tissue. The, the cancer had uh, eroded the bone significantly. Um, and again, as everyone knows, uh, the erosion of the bone is from uh, the uh, activation of the osteoclasts from the tumor cells. Uh, and you can see here uh, atypical mitosis right here. So you see a cell that's undergoing mitosis, and it shouldn't it shouldn't be doing that normally. So this patient um, uh, will be scheduled once she heals things for chemotherapy and external beam radiation of the tumor. Um, the patient did well from her ileus, resumed eating, went home, but then presented again post-op day 14 with a pulmonary embolism in her left upper lobe, unfortunately. She was admitted. Uh, she was evaluated and had a CAT scan, and uh, she had a clot uh, in the pulmonary artery. Um, she uh, was stable with this pulmonary embolism and was coagulated, and um, uh, since then has uh, gone home uh, on Xeralto. Um, thanks, everyone.